the US Navy's reserve or mothball fleet is technically something that's existed almost from the inception of the US Navy itself, but officially, in any kind of really organised manner, is actually a relatively recent development. Early on in its history, the US Navy actually had a brief period of non-existence, as after the War of Independence, in one of many phases that would occur after a war had been concluded, Congress decided that clearly it didn't need a navy, and therefore funding was cut down at various points to either minimal, or in that particular case, basically non-existent. However, it turned out that, you know, needing a navy was actually a thing, and within a few years, Congress was having to build a bunch of new frigates, some of whose names, Constitution, Constellation, Chesapeake, President, etc., may be somewhat familiar to listeners of this channel. And so after the quasi-war with France, and dealing with the Barbary Coast pirates, the US Navy was left for the first time in its existence with ships that Congress wasn't willing to pay for to keep in active service, and so they had to go into reserve. Now, the process of putting ships in what you might term a ready reserve in order to reactivate them fairly quickly later was not an unknown thing at the time. Both the great navies of Britain and France at, the, at that period had a fair amount of expertise in this field, the British especially. When it came to the great ships of the line and even the smaller frigates, the process was as follows. You would take the ship into dock, you would remove the masts, you would remove the guns, you would cover over the most obvious hatchways, usually with small sheds or something similar, seal up the gun ports, and then you would take the hull and remove all of the supplies that were inside, gunpowder, food, etc., and then tow it to an estuary, basin, harbour, or similar, and simply moor it up. This was referred to as leaving a ship in ordinary. A small crew would be retained either aboard, or in the case of large numbers of ships perhaps shared between multiple vessels, and their job was simply to tour the vessels every day and keep an eye out for leaks and more major defects such as rot. If those occurred, fix them, try not to knock over any candles and set the thing on fire, and occasionally bring along a ratting dog to clear out the vermin. The supplies would obviously be repurposed for ships that were still in active service, the guns would go ashore and be stored separately, and the masts and yards would either be repurposed for other ships that were in service or potentially stored away, as they were quite valuable. Once war came again, you would simply put the ship back into dock, re-equip it with all its guns, resupply it, which could be done in a relatively quick time, and the single most major task was usually putting the masts back in. Once it was masted and re-rigged, which might take a small amount of time, but in the grand scheme of the speed of war and the rising tensions that would lead to war in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, this wasn't a huge imposition on national security, and then the ship would be ready to receive a crew and sail out again. This did, however, require a significant degree of underlying infrastructure, both in terms of shore-based cranes and crane ships, dockyards, basins with crew infrastructure and accommodation nearby, storage areas for armament and such. And so, whilst Britain, which was periodically at war with part or all of the rest of the world for much of the 1700s and the early 1800s, had a fairly good reason to keep large amounts of ships in, in reserve and move them in and out of reserve on a fairly regular basis, the US Navy was much smaller, did, but still didn't have anything like this degree of infrastructure, and unlike the Royal Navy, which was still keeping a relatively active force even in peacetime and receiving the funding for it, the US Navy had barely two dimes to rub together at times. As a result, the age of sail process for retaining ships in reserve in the US Navy was somewhat ad hoc at best. Occasionally, a ship would be put into ordinary following the correct and full procedure, but more often, the ship would simply be towed up to a dock or a quayside or a buoy or just an anchorage, some minimal amount of stuff removed, usually the perishable supplies, and occasionally some of the guns, and just left there. Occasionally people will go to check on it, 
but not a tremendous amount was, of care was taken in the upkeep. This, in turn, meant that whether or not a ship was suitable for use at some point in the future when it was needed was largely down to luck of the draw. How good a condition had the ship been in when it had gone into reserve? How conscientious were the reserve crew that were assigned to it? What was the weather like in the area that it had been put into reserve? And how well had the ship been sealed up, if indeed it had been sealed up? In a port with a decent climate and without any major storms in the interim, short-term reserving of ships could work just about in this manner, and indeed the original six frigates, or at least the ones that survived the War of 1812, would bounce back and forth between reserve and active service during much of the early part of the 19th century. However, ships that were put into longer-term storage, which would eventually include some of the frigates, and also most of America's fleet of ships of the line, some of which went straight from dockyard into reserve for extended periods, had to endure the rolling of dice using all of the above factors for years, if not decades, and this could result in some highly variable outcomes. USS Constitution, for example, came out of one relatively long period in reserve in a reasonable enough state. It needed a little bit of work, but nothing too onerous. Meanwhile, one of her sister ships nearby was also being brought out of reserve in response to the same flare-up intentions, except it was discovered that the poor old ship was so rotten as to be completely impractical for reactivation, and the only choice was to break her up and salvage what you could. US ships of the line faced pretty much the same issues. Some of them, such as USS Independence, ended up serving in the Navy for almost a century. Admittedly, most of Independence's time in the Navy was not spent as a frontline warship, but more often as a stores or accommodation ship, but she was still functionally intact for most of that period. Whereas other ships of the line built just after her would spend the vast majority of their lives in technical reserve and then be broken up because they decayed too much. Still others, unfortunately, would end up being burned either on the slipway because they hadn't been finished or in their reserve status when Norfolk Navy Yard was taken by the Confederate Army at the outbreak of the American Civil War. Speaking of that conflict, this was pretty much the next time the US Navy underwent a major expansion, for obvious reasons. At the conclusion of the conflict, however, the US Navy was left with an embarrassment of riches when it came to shipping. Granted, a bunch of it had been taken up from merchant service, and that was relatively easy to return to said service. However, there were a mixed bag of pre-Civil War warships, as well as Civil War-built large warships, small warships, and of course, ironclads, mostly in the form of monitors. And once again, Congress decided that they didn't need a navy anymore. Whilst the cut in budget was again massive, the US Navy did have a little bit of breathing room when it came to cutting down the size of the fleet, as the pre-Civil War warships for the most part could either be broken up or sold on to other countries, and likewise even some of the earlier monitors and other vessels built during the Civil War were either so worn out that they needed to be scrapped, or, due to the rapid pace of technological advancement and ship design during the war, they could be sold off to other navies without much risk to the US's security. This is the reason why a number of ex-US Civil War era monitors would find themselves on varying sides of different conflicts in South America over the next few decades. But this still left the US Navy with more ships than they could afford to keep in service, and so many of them went into reserve. Whilst their iron hulls, or at least iron strengthened hulls, were in many ways somewhat more durable than the older ships of the line when it came to withstanding bad weather and some forms of the elements, they were still generally left in pretty much a similar state to the way that older ships of the line and frigates had been before the American Civil War. And so similar rates of random attrition would strike at the ships that were left in this state. Some of them, like the Kearsarge, relatively famous victor of the battle against the Confederate raider Alabama, would go into and out of reserve on a semi-regular basis, as otherwise it was a relatively useful and relatively economical to run patrol vessel. 
the Hartford, which had of course been the flagship of Admiral Farragut during the Battle of Mobile Bay, ended up spending four years in reserve from 1868 to 1872 before being brought back into commission and then put into reserve again from 1890 to 1899. Partly due to age and partly due to the continuing lackadaisical efforts made in preserving ships that were in reserve, Hartford had to spend the last five years of the 19th century being rebuilt extensively. She would later go on to a career as a training ship before finally being disposed of by being left to deteriorate in the 1950s, but at least in terms of overall lifespan she was one of the lucky ones. One other method of keeping ships in quote-unquote reserve was a particular feature of the US Navy in this latter part of the 19th century and does bear mentioning here. This involved ships that had been on the stocks. They hadn't quite been completed yet. In some cases they'd only just about been laid down when money from Congress dried up. Since they represented the latest and greatest designs, at least at the time, the US Navy was somewhat loath to break them up on the stocks where they could avoid it, with the idea being that hopefully in a few years Congress would see sense and they'd get enough money to complete them. Well, that proved to be something of a forlorn hope and the years went past and the ship sat in the stocks and the materials sat on the docks and nothing much was done about them and as the years progressed it became more and more evident that what had been the latest and greatest design in the mid-1860s was 5, 10, 15 or more years later no longer really competitive. But since they were technically a form of reserve vessel and theoretically could be completed in relatively short order if the US needed more ships again, the US Navy decided that you know something needed to be done about this. And so a great scheme was concocted. Congress, when it figured it out, was of course get very annoyed, but they didn't figure it out for a good long while. And it went like this. Money would be appropriated for quote-unquote repairs to the vessels that were on the stocks, because of course, you know, they're deteriorating, they're left out, been left out for years. And this money would go to the dockyard and, yes, work would begin on what looked like the skeletal frame of a ship. But effectively what had happened was that, quietly in the background, a new ship had been designed. Completely different from the ship that had actually been initially under construction. Effectively what was happening was the ship on the stocks, such as it was, was being broken up and a brand new ship somewhat made out of the pre-stocked materials and using the existing nameplate was being built in its stead. Thus, over the 1870s and 1880s, a slow trickle of US Navy vessels would come into service, brand new, ostensibly being the same ship that had been laid down either at the end of or just after the end of the Civil War, but to anyone with a working pair of eyes who bothered to go and have a look at them, quite clearly a somewhat different vessel from that which had been originally ordered. Unfortunately, when Congress did catch wind of things, it managed to put the kibosh on some of the last tranche of these vessels, which were almost at a stage of completion. But, you know, it was a fairly creative way of turning what had been an obsolete reserve vessel into a potentially slightly more modern reserve vessel. And that speed run brings us to the next big build-up of the US Navy. At the close of the 19th and start of the 20th century, the US Navy was trying to assert itself as, if not one of the leading powers, at least one of the great powers of the world. And you had the build-up of the pre-dreadnought fleet that led ultimately to the voyage of the Great White Fleet. With the voyage of the Great White Fleet accomplished, they came, well, they came home to find dreadnoughts under construction, and whilst Congress was still keeping a fairly firm boot on the throat of the US Navy's finances, they were at least still building up their battleship fleet, it, albeit somewhat slowly compared to Britain and Germany, but thanks to not getting involved in the First World War directly until 1917 and being somewhat remote from the actual battlefields, the US Navy was able to continue its battleship building program through most of the 1910s, where the other two larger navies had been forced to slow down or suspend theirs. Then, 
Come 1916, the floodgates of funding opened and suddenly ships were being built left, right and centre. Well, at least capital ships and destroyers were, the US Navy apparently having forgotten the cruiser, at least until they started the Omaha class in the 1920s. But, of course, all good things must come to an end, and with a change in government that was uh, somewhat less outwardly inclined, coupled with the conclusion of the Washington Naval Treaty, the US found itself with a vast, vast array of ships it had literally just finished building and no particular amount of funding to keep them in active service, and indeed the change in government reflected a change in general political will of the American people, and a more isolationist bent was on the rise, and thus the US had a choice. It could either scrap vast, vast, vast numbers of ships which were relatively modern, or had at least been built relatively recently, alongside scrapping the older and more obsolete vessels, or they could get serious about reserve fleets. Technically speaking, an Atlantic and a Pacific reserve fleet had been formed in 1912, but, you know, with the build-up associated with World War I, they hadn't been massively used. Policies and procedures were therefore drawn up on how to properly deactivate, store, and preserve the new fleet of steel warships, and for the most part, promptly ignored. Whilst some procedures were put in place, the vast majority were not, and we'll come back to what those were later on in this video when we talk about the time when, you know, the US Navy actually started following those procedures. But regardless, in the early 1920s, vast rafts of ships began to form in various reserve bases. Mainly, these com were composed of Wicks and Clemson class destroyers, of barely a few years out of the stocks, and in a uh, move somewhat similar to the post-War of 1812 US fleet, some of them effectively moving straight from shipyard into the reserve units. Instead of following the procedures that had been drawn up, as mentioned earlier, they were slapped with a large amount of red lead-based preservative paint that was designed to keep the rust away, hence earning the appellation the Red Lead Fleet, and vast amounts of packing grease were slathered on various movable parts, mostly the machinery and such like, in the hope that this would keep these relatively delicate parts moisture-free and thus able to be reactivated at some point in the future when they were needed. Whilst a significant step up from previous efforts to preserve ships that were in reserve formations, it still wasn't something that was completely up to standard, and this would show later. But, in the interim, this policy did bring about quite a few benefits for the US Navy. As a Navy that had previously not had all that many destroyers to go around, but in the end of the 1920s, they discovered that a total of 60 of their destroyers, again, more than they possessed for a good chunk of the early part of the 20th century, had dodgy boilers. In a previous time, that would have basically meant scrapping the whole destroyer fleet and starting again. But... In the period of the Great Reserve Fleets, it simply meant identifying the 60 best condition Wicks and Clemson class destroyers sitting in reserve, and scrapping the unsatisfactory ones and bringing these others out of reserve. Now, to be fair, things like armament and superstructure and other useful recyclable bits from the dodgy ships were taken off, and in some cases used to replace parts that had deteriorated on the reserve ships. But overall... Within a period of about six months, 60 destroyers had been completely cycled out and in to the US fleet. The cost of maintaining and keeping preserved those destroyers was massively less than it would have cost to build 60 new ships. Battleships and cruisers also went in and out of the reserve fleet formations during the 1920s and 1930s, although not all of them had the same red lead paint and massive amounts of grease attached to them as the destroyers had done, as some of them were simply being put in reserve for a couple of years whilst they waited for an opportunity to recommission again, and so would have commensurately less done to them. Others, especially some of the older ships, such as the latter pre-dreadnoughts, would go into deep reserve and have similar treatment to the Wicks and Clemson swarm that was cluttering up two entirely separate bays. 
one in Philadelphia, which served as something as a reserve for the Atlantic Fleet, and one in San Diego, which was the reserve for the Pacific Fleet. By the time that World War II was beginning to take shape in Europe, there were only 110 destroyers sitting in reserve for the US Navy. And with a limited national emergency state being declared in 1939, 40 of these would be immediately reactivated and recommissioned. Whilst obviously the 60 best had already been brought into commission in the late 1920s, the next 40 would be the next best set of destroyers. And this is where issues began to show up, because whilst the paint and the grease had kept the deterioration from some ships, it had not been equal by any way, shape or form. One of the destroyers that had been reactivated in that first wave was the USS Greer, and it would become the first American ship to engage in active combat with a German vessel, as although Pearl Harbor hadn't happened yet, in the autumn of 1941, Greer set about depth charging a German U-boat, which had fired on the ship first. Of the now 70 destroyers left in reserve, another 50 would be transferred to the Royal Navy as part of the Ships for Bases deal, and these were partly by process of elimination and partly by deliberate choice, the ones that were in the worst condition of all. The Navy was not generally happy with either of the two recommissionings that took place in 1940 and 1941 for themselves and for the British. By this point, some of these ships had been in reserve for two decades, and in theory were preserved in one of three states of readiness. A state that could allow the ship to be reactivated in a month, in two months, or in three months. But when it came to doing this particular set of reactivations, it was often found that you could multiply any of those estimates by a factor of three and arrive at what it would actually take to bring that particular ship back into service. There were problems with mildew on pretty much anything organic and rust on anything inorganic. Over two decades, the grease had gradually either dried or worn away, the red lead paint had flaked away or deteriorated in the sunlight, and they found machinery that had been frozen in place, rusted, or was perhaps completely unworkable because organic parts such as dials, uh, which had paper faces, had rotted away. And of course, you know, some of these ships had equipment that was completely cutting edge for 1920, not so much for 1940. Grateful though they were for some emergency convoy escorts, the British did send back an extensive list of issues, which included, but were not limited to, leaks in the hull, where the hull plating had deteriorated to the point of rusting through completely, bulkheads similarly rusted through and no longer watertight, superstructures, again, a victim of rust, somewhat lopsided and given to worrying shifts and lurches in sea states, electrical and plumbing systems that had corroded away with, you know, sometimes lethal and sometimes noisome results, and a lot of machinery that had been effectively made to just about function and very quickly broke down. Whilst none of those that weren't lost in active combat operations were scrapped during the war, they were scrapped pretty much immediately after the war, and in the latter part of World War II would quite often find themselves serving purely in training or other secondary roles as the convoy escort duties were taken over by destroyer escorts, frigates, sloops and corvettes of somewhat more modern design. However, it wasn't all doom and gloom. These issues had highlighted plenty of problems, to be sure, but it meant that the Navy Department was now very conscious of you know, policies that hadn't been followed and things that might be done better now that technology had advanced since it had been two decades since the main reserve fleet had been created. The policies and procedures that had been drafted for the 1920s deactivations were spruced up and improved, and new procedures and policies were drafted, including the need for more frequent inspections, which was identified as one of the key failings of the interwar preservation efforts. Interestingly enough, by 1943, despite the war still being very much an ongoing concern, 
The Navy Department had already started to make certain plans for transitioning the fleet from wartime to peacetime, and by May 1944, still almost a year and a half away from final victory, they were beginning to order, acquire and store materials and equipment that would be needed to place many, many ships in reserve. The initial order assumed that they would have to put a thousand vessels into the new reserve fleets. Planning to do this at the rate of about 100 ships per month, or about three ships a day, it would still take most of a year in order to deactivate the number of vessels that they were thinking they were going to have to do. And of course, by mid-1945, they were actually looking at even more vessels than that. Whilst in the 19th century, by and large, naval reserve vessels had been placed effectively in naval dockyards, or occasionally in the vicinity of civilian dockyards, effectively tucked away in a corner where they wouldn't get in the way, and from the 1910s onward, two fairly large resources in San Diego and Philadelphia had been the primary areas of storage, it was quite clear that neither of these places could support anything close to the amount and size of vessels that were going to be coming in for deactivation once World War II was finally over. And so, space was cleared in places as far afield as Bremerton, Philadelphia of course, Mare Island, Boston, Charleston, Bayonne, Green Grove Springs, and several other places besides. They'd need the space, and the materials. At the end of World War II, the US Navy had almost two dozen fleet carriers in commission, and more on the way, a small slew of light carriers, dozens of escort carriers, almost two dozen battleships, two Alaska-class supercruisers, almost two dozen heavy cruisers, four dozen light cruisers, almost 400 destroyers, almost as many destroyer escorts, almost 250 submarines, and that's before you get down into smaller ships, training ships, and of course the massive amphibious forces that the US had put together over the course of the war. The plan the US Navy had was actually to maintain three distinct fleets. An active fleet, a ready reserve fleet that should be kept in a state of readiness such that it could basically sail for action as soon as you could get crews aboard, and then a deep reserve fleet that would take some time to activate. The idea was that the active fleet would consist of the Iowa class, 13 carriers consisting of the best of the Essex pl class plus the Midways, 13 escort carriers primarily doing anti-submarine warfare work, 8 heavy cruisers, 20 light cruisers, 139 destroyers, 40 destroyer escorts, 90 submarines, and all the auxiliary craft needed to support it. The Reserve fleet that was ready to go at a moment's notice would consist of the North Carolinas and the South Dakotas, five more fleet carriers, nine heavy cruisers, nine light cruisers, 36 destroyers, and a number of smaller craft. Everything else that wasn't hopelessly obsolete or far too badly damaged and worn out to be of any further use would be stuck in the deep reserve fleet. You can see from the sheer numbers involved quite why the US could afford to expend multiple older battleships in tests like Operation Crossroads. They simply had an embarrassment of riches. But even these deep reserve vessels were supposed to be available for reactivation at, at best some days notice after the crews arrived, at worst a few weeks notice. In order to ensure this level of preservation, the procedures that had been drawn up were as follows. Every ship that was to go into reserve was to first have a careful overhaul so that all of its machinery, especially the propulsion systems, were seen to be in good working order. Any stores and spare parts would be inventoried and removed from the ship to be stored ashore. Any remaining material and machine deficiencies would be logged so that crews coming back to reactivate the ships would know what to look out for. All of the existing paintwork would be scraped off and a new coat of fresh anti-rust paint would be applied. The ships would then be completely sealed up, and dehumidifying equipment would be installed inside the ships to keep the overall ambient humidity down to less than 30%. They'd then be moved into the various carefully prepared reserve anchorages where dedicated crews would monitor the ships on a daily basis. Unfortunately, this well-prepared process ran into two major problems. 
as with almost every single war before, Congress started cutting funding to the Navy pretty darn quickly. The cuts weren't quite as bad as they had been in previous wars, but they were still fairly substantial. Additionally, crews, understandably, who had signed up to serve for the duration of the war, really wanted to go home, and there was a long queue of ships to deactivate. This was compounded by the fact that the US Navy came up with a demobilization point system. Once you hit a certain number of points, you could be demobilized and sent home. Unfortunately for the reserve fleet project, the most experienced crews who knew the ships best were generally the ones who had served for the longest, and length of service was one of the key factors in accruing your demobilization points. And so the US Navy found many, many experienced crewmen heading home leaving them with either the long service crewmen, which they needed to keep the active fleet running, or else a bunch of, relatively speaking, less well-trained and less experienced sailors, who were, of course, somewhat less efficient at the process of bringing the ships in for mothballing. Waterborne traffic jams developed. As ships queued up and as crews left, very small skeleton crews were left hopping between the ships just to make sure they didn't drift away on the current, with the Navy being forced to call in civilian shipyard workers to help with the process. Of course, most of these workers had never set foot aboard an active US Navy warship, and that slowed the process even further, all of which meant the process was costing more and more money, and money was something that the US Navy was rapidly running out of. As a result, the three-tier plan had to be abandoned. The active fleet would be considerably smaller than had been originally anticipated, and everything else would go into reserve if it wasn't going to be expended. In the space of a couple of years, 12 of the Essex class and 9 out of the 10 modern battleships of the US Navy found themselves in reserve. Only Missouri found herself still in active service to represent this latter class. Such was the scale of the process that practically every US cruiser earlier than the Portland was scrapped, and almost every heavy cruiser from Portland through to some near brand new Baltimore class were all laid up in various anchorages. The story was pretty much the same for the light cruisers. Brooklyn's rubbed shouldered with Cleveland's who'd barely seen a single commission, and the destroyers were even more hilarious. The largest old class represented was the Benson's, but the vast majority of Fletcher's produced found themselves sitting idle, as even did some of the Summers and Gearings. This monumental deactivation was faced with three primary problems. The biggest of which was, of course, moisture. Moisture caused rust, moisture caused mildew, moisture caused rot, and the sea air was pretty heavy with moisture. Secondly, there was a lot of delicate equipment aboard ships, even more so than there had been at the end of World War I. Radar, electronic communication equipment, some of the finer machinery, plenty of electrical fittings, which were now far more numerous, as well as other sensitive equipment such as fire control f computers, were all aboard the ship. They would also be exposed to the elements, and they would break far more readily than the main structure of the ship would. There was absolutely no guarantee that if these things were demounted and stored in facilities ashore, which would of course complicate the reactivation times of the ships, that the facilities ashore would provide much, if any, better protection than simply leaving them on the ships themselves. And finally, it was found that just lobbing massive amounts of grease at anything that was exposed and otherwise supposed to be moving was not actually a viable solution. For one thing, over a long period of time it didn't tend to work, and for another thing, even when it did work over shorter periods, it was an absolute pig to get it all off in order to get the ship moving again. Luckily, thanks to an advance in technology that allowed for the development and installation of electrically powered dehumidifiers, some bright spark in the US Navy hit upon a brilliant idea. Instead of removing the equipment from the ship, how about removing the equipment into the ship, then sealing the ship, and turning the ship itself into a hermetically sealed bubble in which all the delicate parts, including of course all the ship's internals, could be well preserved. The process to do this seems relatively simple on paper, but of course was quite extensive and quite delicate in practice. Firstly, the ship would be overhauled. All the machinery would have to be inspected and cleaned. 
And then a thin film of spray-on rust preventative was applied. Unlike the massive globs of grease that had been used in the past, this was a wax-like substance that was dissolved in a solvent for easy spraying. You simply sprayed it everywhere, the solvent evaporated, and a thin coating of a wax-like sealant was left on all the machinery. This didn't take up as much mass or as much volume as the grease had, and more importantly, when you started the machinery up again, it simply melted away into a little bit of spare lubrication. Once this was done, the next step was fumigation, to stop rats eating everything that was organic and possibly chewing away at some things that weren't whilst the ship was in storage. Next, exterior hatches and portholes were closed in order to keep the interior of the ship watertight. Where there were major in-place pieces of armament, such as 5-inch guns, 6-inch guns, 8-inch guns, 14 or 16-inch guns, these would be covered over with a form of plastic webbing. This would keep the elements out from the areas where the guns obviously came in through their turret mountings. Where guns could be removed, such as Orlok and 20mm guns, they were taken off and taken below. Where guns were a little bit too big to comfortably move, such as both as 40mm, but too exposed, so as to not be able to be just partly sealed off, like 5-inch guns or battleship guns, large domes were erected, thus leading many ships in the US Reserve Fleet to resemble nothing more than a colony of igloos. These hemispherical, or in some cases fully spherical, domes would also be applied to some of the larger pieces of electronic equipment, such as radar antenna. In these smaller enclosed spaces, bags of silica gel would be left to absorb any latent moisture. The big conundrum was the below decks areas of the ships themselves. You needed to leave enough hatches open to ensure airflow was maintained throughout the ship, so that moisture could be taken away and dry air admitted. But at the same time, obviously, you didn't want to leave every single hatch open because then even the smallest leak could result in the ship sinking before anyone knew what had happened to it. Once each ship had been carefully divided into zones such that the breach of any one zone wouldn't result in the ship going under, it was time to think about circulating the air. Of course, with the hatches shut, this was a little bit of a problem, but again, in another stroke of genius, somebody realised that if you drained the ship's firefighting system, which was of course supposed to be able to supply water all over the ship, you could instead pump air through it, and this system was part of the damage control system and therefore would not be affected by hatches being closed. To this system were connected the new electronic dehumidifying units. The design of these hasn't really changed that much in the past 80 or so years. A bed of silica gel or some other similar desiccating agent would have air drawn across it by a fan. This would result in the moisture being drawn out of it, and the dry air that resulted at the other end being pumped back through the ship. The systems used in the reserve ships had an additional feature. There were in fact two sets of desiccant within the machinery one of which would be used to dry the air within the ship, the other of which would be heated by an electronic heating element, thus evaporating the water trapped within it, and this heavily moisture-laden air would be expelled from the ship via a separate air system. Once the tray of desiccant that was being dried was fully ready for reuse, it could be swapped back over again relatively easily, and the tray of desiccant that had been used to absorb the moisture within the ship would take its place in the drying area. As long as they were kept supplied with electricity, a very minimal crew could monitor them in one central location and just make sure that the trays were being swapped over. This meant that, for example, a destroyer only needed one unit, a cruiser would need three units, a battleship or a fleet carrier would need a rather whopping eight units. An initial pre-drying period using cans of desiccant and portable pumps, as well as some portable dehumidifying units would get rid of excess moisture in really hard to reach and very moist places such as the bilge, some forms of piping and bits and pieces of machinery in order to make the job of the preservation units somewhat easier. In some areas of the ship that couldn't be kept open in some way shape or form such as fuel tanks, cans of desiccant were left whilst everywhere else a few sensors were installed and thus, a visit every 12 hours or so by a crewman would be able to check from one location how the ship was doing. In this way, 
a destroyer could be maintained with an electricity bill of about $100 a year. Something like a carrier or a battleship would be about an order of magnitude more expensive, but this was still a bargain price when it came to preserving the multi-million dollar assets that were the warships of the US Navy. All of this prep work would prove to be of great benefit a few years later. As everyone was settling in for the 1950s to begin, the Korean War broke out, which is of course pretty much at the end of the period this channel covers. But it found the active US Navy as a mere shadow of what it had been in 1945. In the Western Pacific, for example, there was precisely one carrier, the Essex-class USS Valley Forge. To be fair, the US Navy was focusing primarily now on the threat that they thought the Soviet Union posed, and so the majority of US forces were in the Atlantic Fleet. But still, one carrier was all that was available to respond. There was also the heavy cruiser USS Rochester, the light cruiser USS Juno, and a dozen destroyers, plus a handful of amphibious and support ships, and that was it. Almost every available US Navy asset was called in. The USS Philippine Sea and the USS Boxer headed over, as did the escort carrier Badong Strait. Along with these would come the cruisers Helena, Manchester and Worcester, with the battleship Missouri and the carrier Leyte Gulf showing up a little bit later. But all of these would take weeks to arrive and furthermore represented pretty much the entire strength the US Navy could commit at that point to the Korean War without fatally depleting the core strength of the Atlantic Fleet. But this was where the US Navy was able to play its spare card, the reserve fleet. The preparations for keeping the ships intact had gone well, and when crews arrived to start the process of recommissioning the ships, they found that it was pretty much as easy as they'd expected to bring them ships back online. Within the space of a few months, the other three Iowa-class battleships, New Jersey, Wisconsin and Iowa herself, various carriers, numerous cruisers and even more destroyers and other ships began to steam up, raise flags and set sail across the Pacific. In the space of nine months, 381 ships more than the entire active US Navy fleet at the time, had been reactivated, crewed and sent to fight. With the conclusion of the Korean War and the Cold War settling in in a big way, the US Navy would of course receive somewhat greater funding from Congress than it had in the latter part of the 1940s, but the point of the reserve fleet had been well proven. The procedures had shown their worth and soon, although many ships were heading back into reserve, various of them would pop back in and out of commission for many years to come, and of course some of them are still with us today, having been so well preserved over the course of more than half a century. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.